Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's great to follow so many great papers. Um, and I'll have to explain a little bit less of, of what I've done and what I found in, in the recent research that we um, completed. Um, so following a mass shooting <clears throat> is a time when we most discuss gun laws and solutions are proposed. Um, one of the most uh, commonly uh, referenced type of policy, of course, is comprehensive background checks. Um, it is well known probably to everybody in this room that under federal law, we have a huge gap in uh, firearm uh, background check requirements. Uh, private sellers who are not licensed dealers uh, are not obligated to uh, conduct background checks or keep records. Uh, 21 states uh, to date have uh, some form of more comprehensive requirements that cover most private transfers of firearms. Um, why is this relevant in the context of, uh, or potentially relevant in the context of fatal mass shootings? Well, um, Professor Zioli's work, um, just to use one example, uh, shows that anywhere from a third to 46% of individuals who engage in mass shootings um, were, were prohibited or, or very likely to be prohibited from possessing firearms. Of course, many of those uh, were in states where uh, there were not comprehensive background checks, and at least there was the potential, right, uh, if there were comprehensive background checks to, to screen out those individuals to prevent uh, firearm access and potential uh, mass casualties. But of course, there's a, there's a, a lot of uh, conditions on that. Uh, some may acquire their firearms before they get their prohibiting conditions. Um, record keeping uh, has been problematic, particularly historically. We're getting better. And um, uh, enforcement is, um, in the studies we've done, uh, relatively lax. Now, there's uh, what I would consider a somewhat more robust way to, um, or to, to enhance background checks is through a purchaser licensing requirement. Currently, nine states in the District of Columbia meet at least my center's definition for uh, a purchaser licensing requirement. That process tends to look quite different than the process for um, uh, comprehensive background checks, which has people go to licensed gun dealers to facilitate these background checks. It, under licensing, you go directly to law enforcement uh, to, uh, to apply. Very quick, frequently, there's fingerprint requirement, which enhances the uh, ability to, uh, make, uh, to identify prohibiting uh, conditions in the background checks. Um, typically, these states have broader prohibitions, in essence, higher standards for legal gun ownership. More comprehensive records are examined, and more time is taken to review those. So it's a much, much more robust process than what we commonly think about when we talk about comprehensive background checks alone without licensing. Um, what, do we, what do we know about um, these two kinds of policies more generally in violence? Well, each uh, is associated with fewer guns being diverted for criminal use. I think that's very important and, and noteworthy. Um, and, and I think licensing, there's good evidence that it is uh, a deterrent to illegal straw purchasers in, in particular. Um, but when we look at the most rigorous studies of comprehensive background check laws uh, and changes in those, many of which I, I think it's important to note, these law changes go back to the 1990s where our records were not nearly as good and the process nearly as robust. But to date, we are not seeing measurable impacts on our common metrics of firearm mortality. Conversely, when we study the changes in licensing laws, we do actually see very consistent reductions in firearm homicides, firearm suicides, and even in the frequency of law enforcement officers shot in the line of duty. Now, of course, there are other policy prescriptions. Uh, Professor Coper mentioned many of them uh, before. Uh, banning assault weapons that are commonly uh, used, particularly in the highest casualties, and the importance of high capacity or large capacity magazines, as he's already defined. Um, expanding pro pro prohibiting conditions. Uh, Professor Zioli sort of touched on that on the domestic violence side, but there are other prohibitions in addition to the uh, which restraining orders qualify for uh, 
prohibitions or not. And then I think it's important to also note that um, when we see mass shooting, another common response for a, a policy response is we need to um, have fewer so-called gun-free zones and make it easier for civilians to carry guns in public places and they could potentially uh, thwart such an attack. Um, right now, I, I think you know, the frequency with which that is done, uh, based upon a couple of uh, FBI studies, uh, suggests that that's a relatively infrequent occurrence, even in, in a time in our, in our country where uh, laws are quite permissive and, and gun carrying common. So what we did in our study, we uh, started with the uh, data from the FBI's Uniform Crime Report System, Supplemental Homicide Report, uh, from, for the period 1985 to 2017. We, like many, def uh, and, and recognize as an arbitrary threshold here, but went with four or more victim fatalities to, to identify these mass shootings, and we um, um, did not consider in this definition drug-related or gang-related or robbery-related events. Now, some states uh, did not have complete enough data to, to um, be included, so uh, five of those states were uh, excluded. We did something, uh, when we looked very carefully, uh, the system is a voluntary reporting system, uh, sadly. <laughs> um, we in public health, we, we, we do mandatory reporting, so it's a little frustrating that the FBI data is, is voluntary. But uh, through some online uh, sources, like from Stanford University and the Gun Violence Archive, we identified 36 uh, fatal mass shootings that met our definition that were not included in the supplemental homicide report of the FBI. These included some of the most notable mass shootings in our country's history, including the Aurora shooting, including the Newtown shooting, and the shooting in Sutherland Springs, Texas. Our analytic approach, for anyone who cares, we got a few researchers in the crowd. Uh, we used um, negative binomial regression models, um, but we'd look at how sensitive it is if we change the, some of the model parameters. Um, but what we modeled were the annual frequency of fatal mass shootings meeting our definition. We also did models for a number of fatal mass shooting fatalities per capita in a state in a given year. Um, we, um, we account for clustering in the data. We look at other um, determinants, uh, potential determinants or correlates of fatal mass shootings in our analysis and use different ways to sort of track uh, unmeasurable uh, national patterns in this phenomenon that have changed over time, as already been mentioned. Uh, so our data included a total of 604 uh, fatal mass shooting incidents over this time period involving almost 3,000 individuals murdered in these uh, fatal mass shootings. Uh, about 30% uh, had a clear uh, connection to domestic violence in terms of the victims. It's a lot of, I, I think we might, uh, might be a slight undercount there, but again, this, these are historical data and, and a lot of times the relationship uh, between the perpetrator and victim is, is not as accurate or, or specific as we would like. Um, let's get to our findings. So our, our estimates are in the form of what we call incident rate ratios. It's basically a comparison of the rate of this event in places with the law versus without. If it's under one, it means generally less frequent, and if it's over more, and we present a confidence interval because there's always uh, imprecision in these estimates. What we find is, in essence, uh, no statistical relationship between comprehensive background uh, check laws as they've been implemented in states uh, throughout our study period and fatal mass shootings. However, a fairly large uh, reduction in fatal mass shootings connected to purchaser licensing systems. Uh, our current, our, our point estimate is, is a 56% lower rate of such um, uh, events. 
Now we looked at other disqualifiers, including some of the domestic violence restraining order uh, requirements. We did not see statistically significant effects there. Uh, many of the uh, point estimates are in the direction of, of uh, 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 violence reducing effect, particularly under conditions uh, where uh, firearm ownership is, uh, the surrender is required, which I, I would consider the most robust type of flaw and again underscores enforcement uh, issues. Um, we, we find no relationship between uh, concealed carry laws and fatal mass shootings, but we do see, as Professor Coper alluded to, a sizable uh, uh, protective effect for large capacity magazine bans, uh, as much as 49% in, in one estimate. Now, in our models where we're looking at the number of fatalities rather than the number of incidents, the findings in the point estimates were remarkably similar. Um, so I'll just say that out, out of the gate there. Um, we did not see uh, statistically significant effects of bans of assault weapons. Again, they were in a direction of protection effect, but not statistically significant. We did a lot of different checks to the robustness of our findings under a variety of different assumptions. I'm not going to go through all the details of there, but what I'll say is through all of our different iterations, we find incredibly consistent those set of relationships reported that are shared here on comprehensive background check laws and licensing. Mostly uh, consistent of findings when it comes to large capacity magazine bans. Uh, somewhat larger effects when you uh, use a higher threshold of fatality, which sort of makes sense, um, and larger effects when you're looking at number of victims as opposed to number of incidents, um, but uh, less clear effects when we assume that the law had a gradual effect rather than a more immediate effect. Um, so I think, again, it's just important to underscore the, some of the consistency in the fatal mass shootings with the other research as it relates to background check, uh, comprehensive background check requirements without licensing and with licensing uh, that, that I think is very important. Um, finally, I just want to say that uh, even though, uh, look, in this study, I'm looking at fatal uh, mass shootings. Uh, that's the phenomenon we're, we're talking about here. It's important to recognize that the policy solutions to this problem of mass shootings could have other harmful effects, and, and, and mo notably when it comes to uh, making it easier for pe civilians to carry concealed guns in public places. The, the latest and best research on this shows consistent uh, increases in violent crime rather than decreases. So uh, that's a summary of, of my findings, and uh, I'll turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you.